I'm going to give you the instructions for this test. I'll introduce each part of the test and give you time to read the question. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll hear each extract once only. Remember, while you're listening, write your answers on the question paper. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now turn over and look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a GP talking to a patient called Daniel Anderson. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hi, it's Daniel, isn't it? Yes, Daniel Anderson. That's right. Hi, Dr. Hampton. I haven't seen you for quite a while. What brings you in today? Yeah, I probably should have come in before now. Okay, well, that's fine. So how can I help? Well, basically, over the last couple of weeks, you know I play football on Sundays, and a bit more than a couple of weeks ago, I was getting a bit more tired than I used to be. Like, I'd get out of breath in the game. I'd get puffed out. But more recently, it's been little things like walking up and down the stairs and stuff like that. That's got me a bit tired as well. So I was just wondering what's, what's wrong with me, really. OK. Uh, when did you first start feeling poorly? Can you remember? That's the thing. I, I had a cold, you see. Well, I thought it was a cold. I had a sore throat. And I was quite under the weather for that. But I've never really recovered since then. And uh, how long ago was that? That'd be about a couple of months ago now. A couple of months? Did we see you with that? Uh, well, so I, I made an appointment um, on the phone, but... I didn't come in in the end. No, I didn't see you on the computer. So you just basically managed that yourself and... Um... Yeah, I, I thought it was getting better, but it's never really... I suppose that's never really gone away entirely. So maybe it was something more than a cold. I don't know. Okay. Um, what symptoms were you getting with that cold at the time? Um, bad sore throat. My glands were felt quite big as well. So... Um, I was just really tired, really, you know, no energy. Were you short of breath at that time during the cold? Yes, but not as much now. That's why I've come in now, because it's gotten worse. It's got a bit more noticeable. But the cold symptoms have gone away now, pretty much. I still get a bit of a sore throat every now and again. Right, OK. Uh, when you're at rest, do you get short of breath? Uh, no. No, OK. Ever had asthma? No, I've never had asthma or any sort of chest problems as far as I can remember. Nothing like that. And do you have a particular diet? Are you a vegetarian or anything? No, I'm not a vegetarian, but I hardly eat any meat either. I eat a lot of fried rice and instant noodles from the university cafeteria. The food's quite cheap. I know I should eat fruit and vegetables, but I'm a student. I suppose my diet is terrible, if I think about it. Some days, all I'd have is uh, instant noodles and some hot chips and the usual four or five cups of coffee. You drink a lot of coffee then? Yeah, it keeps me going with all the assignments and things. OK. Um, have you noticed any problems with abdominal pain or indigestion? No, no, nothing severe, no. Nothing severe? Have you had some from time to time? No, not really. Well, you know, I've had some mild discomfort occasionally, but that could just be indigestion, I suppose. I don't know. It's something I've had on and off for years, really. It's nothing new. It's nothing new, OK. Um, any nausea or vomiting with this? No. What about your bowels? Have they been working normally? Uh, yes, been fine. I haven't had any diarrhoea or anything. In particular, not past any black or very dark motions? 
No, nothing like that. And uh, what about family history? Is there a family history of people getting anemic, for example, for any reason, as far as you're aware? No, not that I can think of. No one's had any sort of um, blood disorders or anything? No, nothing like that, as far as I'm aware. My parents are very fit and active, and my brother doesn't have any health problems that I know about. Right, so they're all fine as far as you know. So, Daniel, did you have an idea in your own mind what this might be? Um, I thought it maybe could have been related to the cold I had because one of my friends did have glandular fever around like a few months ago because my glands were up. I thought it could be related to that. You hear a GP talking to a patient called Mrs. Wright. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Afternoon, Mrs. Wright. I'm Dr. Kildare. Now, unfortunately, your usual GP is away today, so I'm going to help you if that's okay. That's fine. Thank you for seeing me. Okay, so uh, I've got some notes, but it'd be helpful if you could tell me, in your own words, about the problems you've been having. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Grimmett asked me to come back and check in about my foot. I've had gout, you see. Okay, so just remind me, what, what happened with your gout? Well, the first time was late last year, about two or three months ago. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Grimmett had to treat me at home. It was pretty bad. I could hardly walk. Oh. We used steroids at the end to get a hold of it. I had the prednisone tablets, uh, 30 milligrams for five days. Right. All the blood tests showed that I had the tendency to gout from crystals, so Dr. Grimmett gave me the allopurinol, trying to calm that down longer term. The doctor said to contact the clinic if it got worse or come back around now just to check in. Right. Uh, so we haven't seen you. Is that a good sign? Well, I had... Um, it, was, it was a good job I had the repeat prescription for steroids because just after Christmas I had a bit of a flare-up again. Ah. Um, I, I suppose I was eating a bit too much rich food and probably had more to drink than normal. But I have been watching it a bit. Mm. Um, the doctor recommended I drink more water. Uh, he said eight glasses, a couple of litres. And I've been trying, but yes. it's a lot, you know, and I'm busy. So I don't think I drink more than six glasses through the day. Um, but it's definitely more than before. Right. Well, that, that's really good to hear. Water can definitely help. So it's great that you're keeping that up. Sorry, do you mind just describing where the swelling was when you had it? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, well, both times it started down the side, kind of at the base of the second toe on my left foot mm. there, and then the whole foot swelled up across my smaller toes to the outside of my foot. Ah, I see. And both times I started getting a lot of pain and it was all kind of spreading down from that area and it went across the toes and started swelling up quite badly, really hot and inflamed. But it never goes to the big toe. Mm. So the second time, it never swelled up quite as bad as it did before, but I think I caught it in time when I went and got the steroid tablets from the chemist. Ah, good. So how long did it take to settle down once you started the tablets? It was a lot better than last time. I went straight back down within a week, so it was a lot better. Right, and, and when it settled down completely, is, is it back to normal? No, it's never been back to normal. Um, I still have pain on that second toe where it always was right from the start, um, mm. and I've still got it now. Right, and, and how are you getting on with the allopurinol? Uh, yes, it seems to be better. Um, I don't have any problems with it. I'm taking them okay, mm. but like I say, that second toe is still giving me a little bit of a problem. Mm, I see. At the time, the doctor actually wondered if it might be a stress fracture, mm. um, but I had a foot x-ray and, and that was clear. But I just think it's a bit unusual that it's still sore. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, everything points to gout. 
and the blood test confirmed that was the most likely thing. Yeah. But that toe, it isn't the usual joint, as you know, for gout. It's usually the big joint, isn't it? Yes, that's right. The big toe is typical. But when I had the flare-up, the steroids really helped quite quickly. I stopped taking painkillers after two days at most. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's it's less severe and we've got a hold of it better. So I guess that means the allopurinol is helping, right? Y yes, I think so. So I'm still quite keen to carry on with that tap. That is the end of part A. Now turn over and look at part B. Part B, questions 25 to 30. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Now look at question 25. You hear a nurse in the emergency department discussing the care of a patient with a doctor. Now read the question. So, who have we got here? This is Adam King. He was brought in with a dislocated shoulder. He has Marfan syndrome, so we've seen him before with this. Last time he was here, the shoulder popped back in while we were putting his arm in a sling, and he was able to put it back in himself just by relaxing his muscles, but he's in quite a bit of pain right now, so he's having trouble calming down and getting those muscles relaxed. Right, I see. So do you want to start with some nitrous and some pain relief? Yes, I think that's best, just until he calms down. Question 26. You hear a trainee doctor discussing a patient diagnosis with a tutor. Now read the question. Let's have a quick chat about the diagnosis for Janine in Ward 2. Yeah. I was a bit unsure about that one. Um, because it's a young patient, it's quite... It's not going to be diverticulitis or... Well, it's possible, but she is young, so... Yeah, it's unlikely. So, what do you think? What else could it be? What else happens in the bowel? Something common. Think about common things. Bilateral lower abdominal pain? Uh, because it's like radiating into the back? Yeah, something very much, much more common than that. Gastroenterological? Yeah. Um, I can't think. Possibly related to diet? Celiac disease? Perhaps, but there's not a lot of other symptoms pointing to that. What else would give you discomfort in the bowel? Lower abdominal pain. Mm, I suppose if they're just constipated. Right. Yeah, constipation. Question 27. You hear a hospital nurse briefing a colleague about a patient recovering from elective surgery. Now read the question. So, who have we got in bed eight? Bed eight? Uh, Mr Bernard Chambers, a 50-year-old man, had an elective bilateral inguinal hernia repair this morning. His wound is covered and dry and his post-operative observations are stable. Temp is 37, his blood pressure 140 on 70. He's already started eating a little and his walking is tolerated. Analgesia is written up but he hasn't needed anything. He's planned for discharge tomorrow. His wife can pick him up and he'll need a sick certificate for work before he leaves. Can you make sure he gets that, please? I asked the ward clerk to copy some post-op information for him, but I haven't had a chance to look through it with him. Question 28. 
you hear two hospital managers talking about an information session for people who want to do voluntary work. Now read the question. So, how's the planning going for the future volunteer information evening? Well, we've had a lot of RSVPs already, so I'm really happy with the way the event management systems have worked. Having a bit of trouble sourcing some good catering, though, considering that these people are freely giving their time to come and learn what is expected, I really want to provide some nice food and refreshments for them. Have uh, you got any contacts you like using? Yeah, look, that's right. It's a small thing we can do for those participants. I'll tell you what. I'll ask around my team for some recommendations for something a bit special. Great, thanks. I really appreciate it. You hear a pharmacist talking to a doctor about a patient's medication. Now read the question. Uh, sorry to bother you, Dr. Anderson. I just wanted a quick word about Mrs. Campbell's prescription. The one for diphenhydramine that you gave her last week. Ah, oh, yes, for her allergies. Yeah, so she's been taking 50 milligram tablets for about a week now. The thing is, she's just been into the pharmacy and she says that the tablets are making her feel really drowsy and her mouth's really dry ever since she started on the pills. Really? Well, that does happen from time to time. But uh, maybe switching her on to a different medication wouldn't be a bad idea. OK, I'll look into some options and then run them past you later, shall I? Fine, thanks. Question 30. You hear a doctor advising a patient about a change in medication. Now read the question. Now the good news is that I don't think that antibiotics are going to help, so we don't need to think about those. And what I'll be advising actually is, from now, I'll be advising to start with a daily antihistamine. It's called cytirizine. I'll write that down for you because it is cheaper to buy than it is on prescription. And it probably is the number one choice for... I hope you don't mind this bit of scrappy paper That's okay, here. that's okay. The number one choice for hay fever at this stage. This is one tablet a day. Now, for most people, it's absolutely fine. One person in about 100 gets a bit drowsy with this, so if you find when you've taken this that you get drowsy, then it could be this, and we maybe need to think of other options, and we'll come back to talk about that. That is the end of Part B. Now turn over and look at part C. Part C, questions 31 to 42. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear an interview with Dr. Christine Erickson, who's talking about her research supporting non-fasting lipid blood tests for cholesterol. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Hello and welcome to Health Research Roundup. For decades, people have been asked to fast before they have blood tests to check cholesterol levels. However, a new research report from an international group of experts suggests that this is not necessary. To discuss this research, my guest today is Christine Erickson from Copenhagen University Hospital, who was a lead author of the study. Christine, welcome. Thank you very much. So why did we ever ask people to fast for blood lipids, for your blood fats? Well, if you ask me, I don't really know, except for that's what we've been doing for so many years. I really tried to read the literature and find some very scientific evidence supporting that it is superior to just taking a random non-fasting blood sample as we do now. And I had problems finding the evidence. There's a lot of arguments people put forward for why you should use fasting versus non-fasting. But really solid evidence that is better, I can't find it. So was this a tradition rather than science? I think so, yes. I mean, you can ask me why did it start. I think that some of the early studies, the original publications way back, said that they used fasting samples and therefore everybody thought you had to do that without really thinking why. But those early researchers may have had good reason to do it that way, but there's nothing I've seen that said it had to be done that way. And there's all this evidence now from Canada and the US, two excellent studies, one in children and one in adults. And then we have a lot of studies from Copenhagen, and they all show that when you just look at people that eat and drink whatever they usually do, and you take a lipid panel, cholesterol triglycerides, a very common fat in the blood, then they don't really change very much in response to when you have been eating. So there is a difference? Yeah, the difference is in millimoles per litre. So it goes up by about 0.3 millimoles per litre. However, in clinical practice, when you look at triglycerides, you're interested in whether it increases our 1 or 2 millimoles, not 0.3 millimoles. So that's what's clinically relevant. And even with a bad form of cholesterol, that's not going to make the difference between whether or not they put you on medication? Yeah, that's right. Uh, We provide data in this report where we did direct measurement. And after fasting, and in about 6,000 people, and the correlation between the two methods was, I can't see the difference. It looks exactly the same. So you moved over in Denmark to this official recommendation about seven years ago. So what's happened since then? Have there been any issues because of undiagnosed cholesterol levels? No, everybody was happy right away. Even the laboratories that didn't change right away, they were pushed by patients because there were reports in the media telling them that at Copenhagen University Hospital, we're doing non-fasting, so everyone wanted to do it. And I can say today, patients, clinicians, laboratories, everyone's happy. Everyone likes it because it's so much simpler. And patients like it because they can go when it suits them to the pathologist. So they're more likely to turn up for their blood tests? Yes, of course. I don't have fantastic good numbers for you, but certainly you hear from so many colleagues that people don't go to have their lipid tests because it's so complicated to fast. And then they have to go to work, to have an important meeting, and they can't do this in the morning. But now, doing a random non-fasting, you can come whenever it suits you. And very briefly, is there any circumstance where you should have a fasting blood fat level done? Well, this recommendation, it's 21 world experts, many from Europe, the US, and one from Australia also. And of course, when you have so many experts, there's always someone that thinks there's certain situations. We list a few where you can do. For example, for patients with diabetes, the fasting requirements might be an important safety issue because of problems with hyperglycemia. But if you ask me way down in my heart? Is it necessary? I don't really think so. Now turn over and look at extract two. Extract two, questions 37 to 42. You hear a presentation in which a researcher called Dr. Milan Petrisevich is talking about the relationship between new technology and medicine in the future. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
Hi, I'm Dr. Milan Petrisevich, and today I'd like to talk about the future of medicine, particularly in relation to the current technological revolution. To many of us, it seems inevitable that medical robots, automation, and artificial intelligence will replace many jobs in healthcare. Surgical robots are becoming increasingly more precise, and right now, man-sized robots can lift and move patients and transport them throughout a hospital. Silicon Valley investor Vinod Kozla once said technology would replace 80% of doctors because machines will be more accurate, objective, and cheaper than the average doctor. He added that eventually we won't need doctors at all. However, I disagree. Instead, I think technology in some specialties will finally allow doctors to focus on what makes them good physicians, treating patients and innovating, while automation does the repetitive part of the work. So let's look at some examples of how different areas of medicine will benefit from current technological advances. Take general practitioners as an example. Many doctors choose this specialty today because they have a chance to make a long-term impact on someone's life. And it's true that GPs enjoy tremendous trust from their patients. But seeing someone only when they are sick makes it hard to prevent disease and ensure someone's long-term well-being. It's even harder to do this when waiting rooms are overflowing and you only have 15 minutes to diagnose the illness, design a therapy, and offer health advice. In the future, wearable sensors and devices that stream data to a doctor's smartphone will notify them whenever vital signs are acting up and provide them with all the data they need wherever they are. These devices will also ensure doctors only treat patients who really need professional care, making it possible to offer simple treatment advice remotely. In turn, this will increase the time GPs have to treat and advise each patient, building trust and ensuring patients act on a doctor's advice. What's more, smart algorithms will allow GPs to tap expert advice on their patients' conditions and act as a gatekeeper, connecting patients to other specialties. And these are just a few examples. So what about radiology? Well, already IBM's medical sieve shows how artificial intelligence algorithms can scan hundreds of radiology images in seconds, doing the repetitive job of finding malignant or out-of-place phenomenon that currently radiologists have to do daily. This technology won't replace this important specialty. Instead, radiologists will have time to supervise how the algorithm is doing, or to research and innovate, making the technology behind these devices even better. Their time will be much more productive rather than spent checking hundreds of x-rays a day. Ophthalmology will bring science fiction technologies to patients in the near future. Retinal implants might give vision back to those who have lost it, or even give human supervision, augmenting what we can already do. In sports medicine and rehabilitation, the first forms of activity records from tech like Fitbits all focused on people who exercised regularly, but only provided basic insight into how they were performing. Now, a new generation of devices tailored to professional athletes is hitting the market with apps providing detailed insights into movement patterns and force output in any movement. Sports medicine physicians will have concrete data to measure how athletes are improving. By the time these reach the mainstream public, sophisticated algorithms will be ready to analyze data from these devices and provide personalized suggestions to improve performance and to speed up recovery. Similarly, video consoles from Xbox to Microsoft Connect will offer a way of monitoring how a patient is doing from a distance by seeing their progress liquidly on a screen. In oncology, this specialty will pave the way for personalized medicine. Even now, oncologists customize therapies to a patient's genetic background and their tumor's molecular makeup. Cheaper genome sequencing and measuring blood biomarkers are speeding up this process, with companies like Grail working on fluid biopsies which could filter tumor cells from blood samples. Tumors could soon be diagnosed earlier and analyzed without costly surgery. What's more, artificial intelligence could soon be used to help oncologists understand and even cure cancer. Already, IBM Watson obtains all the relevant information from millions of studies about a patient's case and makes suggestions for treatment plans most likely to work. In the meantime, patients are better informed about the disease thanks to social media communities of fellow patients. These signs all point to a bright future for oncology in partnership with new tech innovations. So what does this all point to? Well, my conclusion would be that, all in all, many jobs will be taken over by robots and automation in the coming years, but at the same time, amazing opportunities will also emerge, especially in medicine. These will require physicians to acquire new skills and improve their existing ones. 
In my opinion, the majority of specialties will have more time for patients and better insight into disease. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers. Thank you.